EV charging at home is generally much more convenient and cheaper than driving an equivalent gasoline car. However, there's a hidden cost to home EV charging that almost nobody talks about. Let's talk about wires. So wires, they're super unsexy, but super important. Really all they're doing is taking electrons and moving them from your power supply to your vehicle. And there's certain metals that are used to do that. The two most common ones here are copper and aluminum. You can also use silver and gold, but that's getting really expensive. Copper and aluminum have electrons that are pretty loosely bound to the metal, and that allows the electricity to flow through them with relative ease. Now there is resistance in these wires, and that causes them to heat up by a process called joule heating. Now joule heating says that the heat that's generated in the wire is proportional to the current squared. So this means that as your current goes up, the heat goes up exponentially. And the way that wire manufacturers deal with this extra heat is increase the size or the diameter of the wire. As you increase the diameter of the wire, this increases the cross-sectional area of the wire. And the cross-sectional area of the wire is proportional to the diameter squared or the radius squared. And what this means is that the current capacity of a wire roughly scales in proportion to its diameter. So if you have more current, you need a bigger, fatter wire, less current, a smaller, thin wire. To designate the size, you need a standard. And in the US, we use American Wire Gauge, AWG. In the rest of the world, they'll use things like millimeters squared and, and things like that. I'm not sure on all the standards. I'm American, so I'll go with AWG. And AWG is a backward scale, meaning at the higher numbers, you have a smaller diameter, and at the lower numbers, you have a bigger, fatter diameter. And typically in household wiring, you'll run somewhere from a 14 gauge on the small end down to two, zero, even below zero on the big end on the conductors coming into your house. But wire diameter is only one of the factors here. You also have the insulation type that's surrounding the wire. And different insulations can take different amounts of heat. So you'll have the standard wiring on your, your in-wall wiring in your house. That's rated to 60 degrees Celsius. Other insulations are good for 75C and maybe even 90C. However, there is some caveats with that, and I'm not gonna get into all that here today, but for the most part, uh, we want insulation that's over 60 C, that's kind of the minimum, and uh, at the high end, you know, it's always, always better. So, let's talk about wire selection for EV charging. And in this case, we typically will use a fancy little table from the National Electric Code, something like this, that shows the wire gauge on the left-hand side, and then across the top, you'll see different temperatures. Typically, you'll wanna look at that 60 degree column. That is the most conservative uh, column and that pretty much works in every application. Say we wanna charge our EV on 40 amps, which is typical of most of these wall boxes. We'll scroll down the column until we find 40 amps, except that's wrong. We actually want to go down to 50 amps. And the reason for that is you need to have overage on your circuit when you do a continuous load like EV charging. There's two ways to think about this overage. One is to think of it as 125% of whatever your current draw is. So you take 40 amps, you multiply by 1.25, you'll get 50 amps. The other way to think about it is if you have a 50 amp circuit, you're looking at 80% of that is available for continuous load. So if you look at a 50 amp circuit, you look at 80%, that's 40 amps. You see where I'm going here. We need a 50 amp circuit. So we'll scroll down the column in the 60 degree column and you'll see that a six gauge wire is acceptable on a 50 amp circuit. Now there is some caveats. Obviously, if, if your wire is oversized, that's always good, but it's going to cost you more money then. Now you can use the 75 degree column to the right, which gives you a little bit higher current for that wire size but there's a lot of considerations here. For one, your wire has to be rated for it. So this THHN is rated to 90, this, this would be good. However, your breaker and whatever you connect it to, so whether it's an outlet or your charger, all that stuff needs to be rated to 75C as well. You're also going to be running this in a conduit most likely because any of the in-wall wiring, Romex, things like that, that's really only rated to 60C. So you can't use that wire. So there's going to be extra expense and extra you know, things related outside of the wire themselves. Overall though, I would stick with the 60 degree column. That's your safest bet always. Now, if you scroll over in the opacity chart, you get to this whole other section that's for aluminum wire. Both aluminum and copper 
can be used as conductors in an electrical circuit. And a lot of times aluminum is used in larger capacity circuits and it really comes down to cost. So aluminum today, it runs about one third the cost of copper on the same gauge wire. However, if you actually start looking at this table, you'll see that on every ampacity, you pretty much have to use the next wire size larger on aluminum at the same capacity of copper. And this is because aluminum is not quite as conductive or it has more resistance than copper. So you have to upsize the wire. And once you account for that, it ends up being roughly half the price per foot that copper is. So you think that would make aluminum an attractive option. And in some circumstances, maybe it is. I still don't recommend it. Uh, you, you have a lot of issues on the terminations with aluminum. The way they expand and contract tends to loosen things over time and you, you tend to have more problems. If you go back to like the 1960s, 70s, 80s, in that time frame, a lot of homes were wired with aluminum and there's a lot of issues with these can lead to a lot of loose connections and house fires and things like that. So I don't really recommend aluminum. There's a lot of people that don't recommend aluminum, especially for EV charging. So for all practical purposes, stick with copper. It is more expensive, but you're also avoiding some expensive termination things that you need on the ends of aluminum. So as promised, I have some wire here today. I'm rewiring my shop from a 50 amp circuit to a 70 amp circuit. This will allow me to both charge with my EVSE, run my electric heater in my shop and do other things out here that you know are applicable to what you guys are seeing. And really it comes down to the EVSE. So this is a project related to electric vehicles. And I just wanted to show you the difficulty of this as well as the cost of doing this. I have about a hundred foot run through conduit. I'm running the four gauge copper THHN. This runs about a buck 30 a foot and I need to run three conductors. So you're looking at 330 feet at a buck 30, you do the math. This wasn't cheap. You also have to run a ground and, and the ground you can undersize a little bit. I can take that to an eight gauge THHN uh, and run that for another 110 feet. That was about 50 bucks. In total shipped to my house with tax, we're looking at like $560 of wiring. So it's not cheap. And this is me doing the work. Now you're gonna have other expenses related to wiring as well, running the conduit. So you may have to run a hundred foot of conduit. That's gonna run you about 100 bucks just the materials there. Then you're also gonna have the labor to put it in, hang it up, run the wiring. This can easily cost you thousands of dollars over that amount of distance. And if trenching gets involved, I had to trench over 40 feet out to my garage several years ago. I actually did that by hand. I wanted to run a bunch of other stuff too. So I took care of it. It was free, but boy, was that a ton of work. And if you had to pay for that, you're easily looking at thousands more dollars. So wiring to your EVSE can literally run thousands to even tens of thousands of dollars. And this is a huge expense. I'm gonna start here in my basement at my main electric panel, and I'm gonna use the old eight gauge wire I'm pulling out to pull in the new four gauge. However, I'm not going to be starting at this panel. I'm gonna actually start back in a room here at an access point, just so I don't have to be pulling through the live panel that much. But first things first, open up this panel, turn off the breaker, disconnect the wires and we'll start pulling wire. Whenever I'm working in a live panel, I always like to turn off the breakers adjacent to the one I'm working on. This prevents the screw lugs there from being hot and inadvertently touching them with a screwdriver or something. Once the wires were disconnected, I pulled them out of the box just to get everything out of that live panel. And then I pulled everything back to that connection in the room behind the panel there. This is where I'll be pulling from when I go back to the garage. As I mentioned, I have eight gauge running to the garage. So I taped the four gauge to the eight gauge at this connection point right before I go out underground. And then going to the garage, I was able to pull from the garage and my son helped me make sure things were running smoothly as I ran out there. I did run into an issue in the garage where I had to upsize the hard 90 uh, out of the ground. And that was really because it was just too small for the four gauge wire coming through that one inch conduit. So I upsized to one and a quarter inch and then pushed the steel cable through from the electric panel in the garage and pulled the four gauge wire into the sub panel. The story of this install is that four gauge is a pretty meaty wire, a lot 
bigger than the eight gauge I was pulling out. And even cutting it is a challenge. Getting things stripped is a bit of a challenge. But once that's done, you can tighten everything up in the sub panel. Now, you do need to torque this. Uh, since this is a pretty high powered electrical connection, you wanna make sure these connections are tight. So I torqued this with my torque wrench, made sure everything was up to spec. And then once you have the ground put in as well, you can tighten everything up. And I was done on the sub panel and in the garage. With the garage done, all that was left to do was run the a little bit of wire from the connection point where we go underground over to the main panel. And I started this by running my fish tape up through this short section of conduit, taping on the four gauge wire end, and then pushing it into the conduit to get it started. From here, it was a matter of, well, pulling like crazy. I, I should have lubricated this thing and getting that wire through the conduit. I did have the conduit unglued in the house. I, I always glue it underground and that allowed me to take things apart a little bit, get that wire through and force its way around these hard 90s into the panel. I took the 50 amp breaker out, put the 70 amp breaker in and then put on the four gauge wires on the house end, torqued these guys to the spec there, wiggled them a little bit to make sure they didn't loosen up and then came back in and retorqued. This tends to be what is recommended is make sure these things are torqued a few times, we go around, make sure they're not loosening up. They are stranded wire, so all those little strands can loosen or move out of alignment a little bit and make the connection a little loose. So come back in, retorque, and then you are finished. With that done, all all I could do is turn on the power and I was finished. Although this was to get power to my garage, this is a very similar scenario to what you'd see for wiring an EV charger. And from the sub panel in my garage, really I'm just running it to NEMA 1450 outlets or I'm hardwiring it into different EVSEs here in my garage. So this is a pretty typical install. And actually, if you're going for like a 60 amp charger, or I guess it would be more like a 50 amp charger, you're gonna need four gauge wire. So yeah, it's gonna cost a ton. And that begs the question, is it really worth it? And in general, I would say it probably is. And this is just because EV charging is not going away. EVs are coming online. And this is not just an upgrade for your car. This is an upgrade for your future cars. Or even beyond that, if you sell your house, this is an upgrade to your house, to your home, to your garage, wherever you put this. And this should increase the value of your home and its resale value in the future. As people become more and more accustomed to EVs, more and more people buy EVs, this is something they're gonna look at when they purchase a house. Does it come with the capability to charge my car? And if it does, that should add some value. So although it is a significant upfront cost, I do think that this pays off in the long term. It also is something that, you know, it's gonna last a long time. This isn't something that needs to be recouped instantaneously. Now, not everybody needs a high powered 240 volt service to charge your EV. Most people could get away with 120 volt charging if you have that available and if you do that almost continuously when you're at home. You can get about 40, 50 miles a day. I actually did a little series where I, I'm a big driver, but I, I said, hey, can I do this for a week charging on 120 volts? And I did for that particular week. I, there were some caveats with that, but if you wanna check that out, check out my short videos, it's in there. This has been my experience. Your results are gonna be totally different. Every single home is a little different, has different things that make it easier, different things that make it harder. As I said, this can range from you know hundreds of dollars up into the tens of thousands of dollars. And so you have to weigh your situation accordingly to see if it makes sense for you. If you like this style of content, I'm gonna have more coming. I have some really exciting things coming up. Hit that subscribe button, check back often. I'll have more videos for you. I'll see you in the next one.